Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about how to create a high-impact customer education program. This is Panos here from LearnWolds. Just uh, give us a couple of minutes to get everybody set up. I see lots of people joining right now. Let's give them a few seconds, and we'll be uh, on with the webinar. I hope everybody's safe and sound wherever you are. You can just introduce yourself on the chat box here of, uh, of Zoom. Let us know from where you're logging in. Hi, Nicole from Buffalo. Hi, Mariko from our LearnWolves team. Hi, Sandra from Portland. Welcome, everyone. Hi, John, Alex, Ekaterini, Fode. Fouad, probably, Vitoriana from our own team here, Shannon. Welcome, everyone. I hope that you can hear me all right. If you do, then just leave a message here on the chat box. Chris is with us already. And uh, just uh, one more minute and we'll uh, go on. We will not delay. Thanks, Monica. Hi, Mande. Hi, Christian. Hi, Fodini. Hi, Debbie from Plymouth. Hi, Christine. Hi, Jody. We're also very excited covering this topic, having Chris with us. Hi, Romy. Just a few more seconds as I see here the headcount of connected people joining. We're also recording this webinar and we'll make it to you available right after the recording so you don't have to uh, take any notes. You will get access to the, to the full uh, stream. Obviously, you can ask any questions during the presentation using the chat box. Veronica here from my team is also sharing some, uh, some instructions. Uh, we'll make sure to have sufficient time at the end of the webinar to answer as many questions of, as possible. We have already received a few dozens through, your, uh, through the email earlier. Uh, hopefully, we can tackle as many as possible. So I think I can just start my camera here and we can get on with the, with the webinar. Hi, everyone. This is Panos here. I'm the co-founder and CEO of LearnWolds. I'm very happy to hosting this webinar today with Chris Lodolce uh, from, uh, from uh, SAS Academy Advisors. Uh, Chris is one of the foremost experts on how to build and, and scale a customer education uh, program. Today's webinar is going to be about how to create a high impact customer education uh, program. The, the webinar is hosted by LearnWolds. LearnWolds is a, is an e-learning uh, platform, uh, but uh, as we were, we are helping many, many customers around the world launching their own uh, customer education uh, academies. We wanted to go to the, to the root of things and find the, I would say the, the, the most capable person who can talk to our community about how to build and scale a, a program uh, like that. Chris is, a, uh, is an advisor to high growth software companies on customer education programs. Uh, he has uh, he co-founded the HubSpot Academy, very known HubSpot Academy back in 2012. And over the next 10 years, he managed to grow this division to over 30, 30 people. And I'm, I'm sure that you have rather come across the HubSpot Academy who has managed to reach millions of learners and certified more than half a million business professionals 
giving them giving them valuable resources about uh, about uh, marketing and also obviously uh, helping HubSpot growth uh, uh, HubSpot uh, growth through this academy to uh, which I think at the end uh, was uh, published the content was published in uh, in up to five uh, languages even targeting their international market so we are very happy to have uh, Chris with us today and he will be the one sharing his knowledge about uh, what you can potentially do for your own businesses for your own uh, for your own customer uh, academies so uh, just allow me a, a brief introduction of how we came about to discuss uh, on this uh, about the subject and uh, uh, and uh, how we started um, thinking about this in, in more 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 deeply uh, so uh, first of all while we didn't start to serve the SaaS segment, I guess, or the, or the or the SaaS industry, we increasingly had more and more customers from that space coming to us and asking for help on how to build their own SaaS academies, how to educate their customers, how to present their products and their solutions uh, as they became more uh, more complex. So that started becoming, a, I guess, a, a repeating uh, pattern. And very soon we realized, especially during the past couple of years uh, or during the, the pandemic, we, we started realizing that the SaaS industry is obviously accelerating rapidly. We, everybody knows that software is uh, taking over the world and also SaaS is taking over software. So increasingly, we have businesses that are uh, growing uh, at, a, at, a, at a very high, uh, high rate, uh, but also facing increasing competition and have to compete very, uh, very in, a, in very tough markets with uh, with other with other businesses, and at the same time they face more and more demands from their own customers uh, about uh, the needs of using a complex uh, product as as software becomes even more. Uh, complex and even more powerful. There are more things to learn. There are more features to discover. So uh, SaaS businesses always find themselves in a very delicate balancing act between driving business growth and doing that in a sustainable and cost-efficient way, uh, but also keeping up with uh, the, the advancements in technology and try to meet customer needs. Uh, uh, sometimes having experiencing high growth and having an increasing number of, of customers can be a big problem. You can you cannot always scale that up with uh, with people. You cannot always throw customer support or customer success reps at people. Uh, you need to be able to 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 uh, educate people about the ca the capabilities of your product in a more uh, scalable way. So th this is what we were the the questions that uh, customers were posing to us on how how they can use a platform like LearnWolves to, to scale that uh, to scale up their customer uh, education. And, and we see that this is an increasing trend. Uh, we have, uh, I guess there's a confluence of, of factors happening. We have the, the pandemic. We have the social trends of how people consume, how people discover new software, how people uh, tend to to be based on uh, on reviews and uh, and peer feedback on how to to choose. Uh, what tools they will be using. Uh, everybody on the other end expects similar, similar service, expects a customer-centric uh, experience. Uh, I guess all of us are plagued by uh, shorter attention spans and we don't have much uh, time or patience to devote to even learn a new software or to, uh, to, to jump through different hoops to get access to the knowledge that we, that we need. So all this, we realize that all this, uh, all this, factors make it even even more difficult for such companies to keep constantly finding new ways to offer value to their uh, to their customers and uh, and this is where uh, we we understand there's a, a paradigm shift happening towards being more customer centric and offering more value to your uh, to your uh, to your customers and this also has to to do with the customers but it also has to do with the employees of a, of a company and how valued they feel and how they can add value to every customers that, to every customer that they are uh, that they are serving so lots of changes happening uh, in the in the industry and increasingly people turn up to uh, look look up to to customer uh, education in order to offer uh, uh, to to be able to increase the adoption of their software 
and to, to build amazing customer-centric uh, experience. So uh, I guess customer education is just one of the pieces of the puzzle that have to be solved when we're talking about uh, customer success. It's about how to uh, increase the understanding of what the software can do, how to offer more value to customers and how to create, to create positive and effective experiences for both customers and also the customer facing employees that are uh, on the on the on the trenches i guess on the front line and have to face the the customers and, uh, and and serve them on the other end especially as we're now going into a period of uh, lots of uncertainty both for SaaS businesses but all businesses in general we have to make sure that any business impact we have is measurable and it's uh, sustainable and it's uh, it's uh, cost uh, cost effective so not only do we have to provide value but we need to be able to prove to measure and prove and improve that kind of value. So we need to be able to measure the and improve the, the onboarding experience. We need to be uh, able to educate our customers at scale and consistently. And we need to also improve the core business metric, the unit economics of our business, whether it's about customer retention, whether it's about revenue, it's about uh, customer uh, satisfaction, it's about the MRR that the business is generating and is able to, to return. So uh, what we're talking about here is not just a, 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 a theoretical activity that is happening, but it needs to be tied to core business metrics and it needs to be uh, able to be measured and, uh, and be uh, improved. And this is what uh, Chris will uh, talk to us uh, about. So Chris, welcome to, to, to our webinar. And uh, let's hear from you uh, about how we can build a measurable and scalable customer education motion for, uh, for, uh, for a business. Wonderful, Panos, thank you. Great introduction. Um, much of what you spoke to around the pandemic and, and how people are learning today um, is really spot on, especially from the customer education perspective. So thank you again for having me here today uh, and hello to everybody. Um, it's great to, great to be with you uh, in our session today. I'm opening up the chat pane here, so I do have it opened and ready to go. So I love commentary. I'll be asking some questions. Um, just as a reminder, as we jump in, there are no right answers to any questions I'm asking, and there's no points taken away for spelling. So wherever you are in the world, would love to hear, hear from you as we uh, go into this session. Again, if any questions don't get answered, feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn or send me an email. Uh, we had a lot of great questions. I'm sure more will be coming through the Q&A today. I wanna make sure that everyone's questions are addressed. So please feel free to reach out. Let's jump in. A couple definitions for today. Uh, we're gonna go through quick three quick definitions to get started. The first is when we just hear this word customer education. Right? Customer education is really any purposeful and organized content that's designed to impart attitudes, knowledge, and skills. Uh, to customers. So that could be a blog, knowledge articles, documentation, webinars like today, live training, on-demand courses, and more. Um, so as we get started getting our fingers warmed up in that chat pane, I'd love to know what are some of the ways in which you are types of content you are using to educate customers today? Because probably all of us in some shape or form are doing customer education today if we are working for a business. So let's get some uh, answers in that chat. Uh, and I'm going to go on to the next um, definition for today, which is the definition of a customer education program. Right? So a customer education program, really they're strategic initiatives by organizations to educate customers in service of improving top and bottom line business metrics. Right? So this is what Panos was speaking to. It's, there's many reasons why you have a block, right? Many reasons to have knowledge articles to help your uh, your customers and through this list. But when we're thinking about a customer education program in a strategic way, we are focused on, in the end, driving retention, helping with upsell, cross-sell, product usage, NPS, and more. And an exciting thing in the third definition, which I'm going to share today, we won't talk too much about, um, but is what I'm finding a lot of businesses who are doing customer education well they tend to end up then realizing that there's even more strategic value that they can extract from educational content, from customer education. And that moves to this idea of a corporate academy. Right? So this is more of a holistic alignment of learning teams within an organization. 
right? So when we're thinking about that, it's, it's how do you align your industry education, your customer education, your partner and agency education, if that's applicable to you, and then your employee education. Right? By aligning all of those, by finding ways to repurpose and use that content, you're not only creating an organization that's learning and sharing simultaneously, but you're reducing the amount of teams you need to create that content. And so a really exciting uh, um, opportunity and something for us all to think about moving forward. But again, today, we're starting with that customer education program, and we're going to get into now some, some things around customer education and really focus on getting into the mindset. So we're going to have our first activity today. So for the few hundred people here today, uh, I'm going to ask everybody to think back across your lifetime of learning. Right? So from when you were, your first memories is maybe a three, four, or five-year-old. Uh, all the way through the last time you learned, whether that was in a university setting with a professor or maybe a course instructor. And the question is, who is that person that inspired you? Take a second to think about that and share in the chat page the first name of that teacher, professor, or course instructor. And what was it about this person that was inspiring? Right? What was it that inspired you to deep dive into a topic maybe you initially weren't excited about? or helped you figure out a career path that you wanted to go down. I'll be quiet here to give everybody a few seconds to think, um, but again, please share in that chat pane the name and what was it about this person that was inspiring. All right, we have some great ones coming in already. We have here, um, oh wow, I can hardly keep up here. I'm gonna have to pause my screen here. Here we go, Mr. Sunderman, eighth grade science. His excitement about the field was contagious. Tony, grade five teacher, encouraged us to express ourselves through music. Kelly, he was a trainer. I met with him first day of work. He was uh, so touched by his desire to help me be successful. I wanted to do that for others. I mean, I want to sit here for the rest of the hour and a half and just read these, but I can't. Those were all just streamed, read right off. And, and what did we find out? What did we get to the point here? Is it's not just about providing educational content, right? But it's the excitement. It's the inspiration. It's the care. It's the connection with another human being through learning. Right? These are the things that make great education. So sure, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of our blueprint today, but we can't lose sight of that. And if we were to sum that up, and I would sum up all the different customer education programs I've had an opportunity to get insights into and speak with the leaders of, I find there's really, you can break it down into three categories. You have your average customer education programs, and kind of like your average teacher throughout your career of learning. They educate you on a specific topic. It starts there, it ends there. But good customer education programs, it inspires you, it drives tactical action, right? You learn something and you go take action on what you've learned. And the result is that it creates business value for the learner's organization, right? That's what it's all about. It's not just about teaching somebody how to use a product or teaching somebody something. But in a business setting, in a customer education program, it's about them being able to take action. Like tactical action is great. But then we discuss how do we get to from good to great customer education programs. The customer education programs that I see uh, and that have a chance to, to work with that are doing really well, they're not only educating learners on topics and helping individuals take tactical action and drive business results, but they're also driving strategic action that's transformative to the learner's career and their organization. If I was to sum up what great education, customer education programs are, it's that. It's the transformative part of that learner's career and organization. We're gonna get into some more things now, but I wanna make sure we all take that with us. And I'll go back to this idea of average, good, and great throughout today's uh, conversation. So now let's have a little bit of fun. What are those three major mistakes uh, that set your customer education program up for failure? There's really three that I'm gonna to touch on today. 
Um, and I'm just lots coming through the chat pane here. Uh, I'll be sure to get back to some of those questions. Um, but what are those three mistakes? Imitations first. I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of companies and a lot of programs, right? And they're asking me questions and we're on a phone call. And it seems to always go to, we want to be like this business, right? We saw this customer education program. We loved it. Maybe they won an award. We want to be just like that. The problem is no two companies are the same. And so what we end up doing is trying to build a program that's been around, that's fully resourced, and we're starting off a team, or maybe we're retooling a team, um, and the expectations are misaligned, and what we try to do completely misses the mark. So there's two things for those of you starting out building a customer education program, and maybe those looking to grow it. The first is don't focus on trying to be like somebody else. Sure, have that maybe as a, a vision of where you want to go, but focus on committing to help customers excel at their jobs using your products or services. Right? That's what customer education is about, right? And design that customer education program for your company's culture and org structure. All too often, it's we want to take someone else's org structure. We want to take where customer education lives in another company and do it at our company. Sure, learn the many different ways, but really think critically about your company, how your company operates, the culture, the different departments, and then build that team to fit into your culture and org structure. Next is resources. The vision of where you want to go versus the time and budget that you have. All too often, teams will get initial resources, whether that's budget or time or both, and they'll begin building out their program. Um, and that's where it'll stop. And I'll talk to these teams and it's two or three years later and they still have just two people on the team. And they know how important customer education is, but they're not quite sure why they aren't getting more funding. There's two things when it comes to resources and, and it sounds so simple, but this mistake is made over and over again. And I personally have made this mistake as well. Uh, and this is time. Committing to a vision or something, an executive, or a VP or somebody in senior management is looking for. Yes, we can have that course out in three months in time for a launch. Double that timeline, especially if you're getting started. Double that timeline and the budget as well. Double your budget based off of what you expect to spend on that content. One of two things is going to happen. It's going to take longer or it's going to cost more. If you have these two things doubled, you're going to be able to hit your timeline. Uh, so again, always be asking yourself resources. Am I over committing? And have I given myself appropriate time? Because the fastest way I've seen customer education teams lose trust and not get more resources is committing to something for the organization that sounds really great. And then having to come back and say, it's going to take six more months or come back and say, it's going to cost twice as much. In the SaaS world or in the, in the world of product, right, we're looking to move forward. We're looking to launch and learn. Uh, and, and when we're taking too long, it can really hurt. Debbie Smith, Debbie Smith, I love it. Under promise, over deliver. Such a great way to sum up this slide. Um, and then the last is hiring. Uh, all too often, I see these incredible people get hired, but they don't align the skill that, that this person has with where the customer education program is at a given specific time. So how do we make sure we hire the right people and we don't make this mistake of a misalignment between the skills of a person we're bringing on and where the program is to date? First is taking the time right, to understand your customers and the program's needs before going to look for that rock star. Right? Understand the customer in your industry. Then next we ask ourselves, does this person have the learning design, program management, and program skills? And then their attributes, right? Do they have an entrepreneurial mindset? A help first attitude? These different attributes and skills are gonna be dependent on where your program is. If your program is just getting started and you're gonna have one or two people on the team, hiring somebody with a lot of experience who can design a great team, but doesn't have the team to execute it may not be the right decision. We could spend a ton of time on this, um, so we're going to move on, but for those of you um, who choose to come to the workshop or a full day workshop that we're going to be doing free, um, we're going to be going into detail and outlining how and who we should hire, 
some questions uh, and some job descriptions as well that we can all take away. So again, very important. Wanted to make sure we touch on this as a mistake so we don't make it lots more tactical um, advice and templates coming up. Um, for those of you asking me about the workshop, there'll be a link um, at the end of my presentation today and I'm sure it's gonna be shared in the chat pane and we'll include it in a follow-up. It's a pre-registration, again, totally free as we get into the tactics. Um, okay, so now let's get to our customer education growth model. Um, this has come out of simply having conversations with uh, many different folks. Sorry, all I have something popping up um, with many different folks. And in these conversations, we're always trying to figure out, okay, well, where are we today? And where are we trying to go? And really what I found is people tend to fall into as a program, right, as an overall program, really one of these five stages. Right? The ideation stage, the beta stage, the live stage, the scale stage, or the innovate stage of their customer education program. Now that's not to say we couldn't use different identifiers or different words. Today, we're gonna use this. Uh, and I'm just gonna quickly walk through these five stages. And then I'm gonna ask everybody, we're gonna launch a poll and we're gonna ask, where does your customer education program, if you currently have one, uh, fall? So this first stage is the ideation stage, right? So this is, hey, we know customer education is important. Maybe currently we have some blogs, we have some knowledge articles, we have some resources out there. Maybe we even have a course, uh, but it's not a strategic initiative to the business. Right? There isn't a clear focus on how this customer education program is driving business value. Right? The ideation, okay, what is that strategy? What resources do we need? Or how do we make our first hire? Possibly not in those order, right? It might be, well, we're gonna make our first hire because we know nothing about customer education. And from there, we're gonna work with them to create a strategy and then finalize resources. Is that coming from the bottom of the organization? The customer success manager, identifying that they're saying the same thing over and over on a call, or is it coming from the executives down? Next, the beta, right? The beta stage, this is where um, for those of you in, in the product mindset, this is that idea of really kind of finding product market fit. Right? We want to go fast here. There's nothing worse than build, starting to build a customer education program, planning out all of your content that you're going to need, and six to 12 months later, you launch that only to realize 50% of it's out of date. It happens all the time, right? So we're going fast here, right? We're going to run some trainings. We're going to maybe do a live training. Maybe we're going to quickly spin up a recorded webinar, maybe add some slides. What we're trying to really look at is what are the different delivery formats that are working? It does, is the content resonating, right? We're gonna learn, we're gonna iterate, we're gonna document bench benchmarks and processes. So when we find that product market fit and we say, let's build out our library of content, we have our questions answered, we know what's gonna resonate and we're ready to build that library of content. That's then where we come to this live stage. Right? We have this kind of proven way in which we want our, say, first version of our library of educational content to look. And then we say to ourselves, okay, well, we're going to start rolling that out to our intended user base. We're going to start reporting on metrics, right? Not just learner metrics, but we're going to start reporting on other metrics that are specific to how we're driving impact to the business. We also have to keep that content up to date, and we'll get back to that. But it's not just about creating net new content, but it's about updating that content as well. From there, we move to the scale stage, right? So this is now, how do we take this content, right? Let's assume it's in one language and how do we scale that uh, vertically, horizontally, internally, repurposing, reusing that for customers or for employees or potentially globally, right? How do we take this educational content and translate and then localize it into multiple different languages? So this is the area now where we're gonna scale. We're gonna get scale from this content. It's gonna to continue to be reused and repurposed in multiple different ways with, um, you know, with not uh, linear costs behind it. And then lastly, we get to that innovate, right? So this is now when we say to ourselves, we have this educational content. How can we not just scale this content, but find ways to reuse this content in innovative ways? Right. So it, it, an example would be, how do we partner with universities and create a curriculum around our content and put that into a university, something in, in which uh, HubSpot did. Right. So that's one way we could do that. You could work with nonprofits and use that and give this content away as part of the program. 
there's many different ways you can be innovative. And I see here, Nicole says, I don't see uh, innovate as a separate stage. It should run alongside the whole model. Nicole, what a great point, right? It's not about just innovating at a specific stage. There's going to be innovations happening all, all, all the time, just like you'll probably be testing things maybe in a beta stage all along. Um, but when we're thinking about innovating, how do we innovate the program? Your customer education, how do we take that customer education program and find new ways to drive business value? And typically you'll find that if you don't have a good process in place for creating and updating content and then scaling that content, while innovation might be able to take place from a programmatic level, uh, it's very easy to get, um, get inundated with content debt as processes change or break. Um, but a very good point, Nicole, we always want to be innovating. We don't want to just say, oh, three years down the line when we're in the innovation stage, we'll start innovating. Um, so love to see that in the, in the chat pane. Uh, now we're going to launch, now, now that we've gone through these five stages, uh, we're gonna launch a poll. Uh, and that poll is gonna ask you to self-identify which stage do you currently believe your program is in? Again, keeping in mind, this is from a high level programmatic uh, mindset. Where would you place your customer education program? And there is an NA option as well um, for those of you uh, who may not currently be part of or thinking about developing a customer education program. So if somebody with the controls to launch a poll could do so, that would be great. Um, and if we're unable to do that, we will just have everybody share in the chat. We, we, already, we already have. So oh, I already wonderful. see about 50 questions coming in. Perfect. 50 answers. Can you give us a, a little commentary, Panos? What are we what are we looking at here in the breakdown? Uh, 38% are in the ideation phase, 15% in the beta, 13% on a live scale program, 17% on a scale program, 0% on the innovate, or unless everybody's doing it and they and they follow Nicole's uh, approach, and about 17% on the NA option. All right, wonderful. That's a that's a good breakdown. We'll we'll keep moving on. Um, thank you all for, for answering. And again, just a helpful model here to think through what we're doing in each one of these stages. All right, here we go. So now we're going to move on, uh, and we're going to get into kind of the what we're calling the customer education blueprint. Right. So these are seven areas uh, of either designing and building your program, or potentially growing or retooling a program. Um, and one thing I like to call out is how, how unique each one of these sections are and how specific they also are um, to both job responsibilities and skill sets. Uh, and many times we're not gonna find one person who's good at all of this, right? So it's how do you design and build your team, again, for your company and your culture um, that's gonna work for you. And as we go through these sections, again, each one of these sections could be its own day workshop. Right? And we're gonna have the opportunity to dive into these things and be way more tactical. Um, but I'm gonna call out different things in each one of these sections that I find uh, specifically um, relevant and also important um, to building a program that typically get overlooked. So let's start with program leadership. Uh, and I, again, if you, for those of you who are in that scale stage, add your commentary here. Right? Together, we're going to learn a lot more um, than me just sharing. So if, as we go through this, you have any uh, insights or things you'd like to add to the chat plane, pain, please do so. Um, but what I want to call it in program leadership, there's the hiring, there's the org structure, uh, there's career growth and development. But today, I want to focus on the team mindset and the importance of having a team mindset um, when we dig into things like a purpose or mission statement and the principles that are aligned with your company values. Uh, this is really important for creating, again, that inspiring education that drives action, that drives transformation. And, and as a leader of a customer education program, it is very important to consistently reinforce the purpose, the mission, the principles, and do that through exercises, customer stories, and data. There isn't a customer education professional 
who is on a team that I would say is great, that doesn't have a sense of responsibility and ownership and excitement around their work they're doing, not for just teaching people how to use software, but for the impact it's having on those business professionals, for the impact it's having on the business. That's something that as a leader is your responsibility to impart and uphold on the team. Right? So if we apply this idea of average good and great programs to this program leadership, right? that mindset of, I teach people how to use software. The average program, that's the conversation we have. Good customer education programs, as I talk to the folks on those teams, they're saying, I educate people on how to use software to do their job well. Right, so now all of a sudden, it's not just about teaching somebody something, but it's teaching them something specific to, again, doing their job well. And the great programs, if you go on LinkedIn, you'll see this from folks who are in programs that are excelling, and you'll see how they talk about the work that they do and the ownership they take to educate and inspire people on how to achieve their business objectives and excel at their job using said software. So this is what we're talking about when we get into great customer education programs. And it's the responsibility of the leader to reinforce and find the right mechanisms to reinforce that ownership, that excitement for each and every single person on the team, whether you're the video person, you're an instructional designer, or maybe you're just an ops person managing the LMS. All of those roles are critical to the success of building a program that doesn't just teach people software, but truly can, can help transform someone's business, someone's career. All right, that's what we're gonna to touch on for program leadership. We're now gonna to get to program manager. Again, a lot falls into program management. In the workshop, we're gonna dig into that. We're gonna get into some, some worksheets and get very tactical. But for today, I wanted to call it a few things. And we're gonna come back to these in later sections. But the first is to study and understand your company's business model, strategy, and key metrics. I'm surprised at how many times I have conversations with businesses or leaders of customer education programs. And they don't understand their company's business model, their strategy, or their current key metrics. And this makes it really difficult to align your program in a, in a way that's strategic to your business to drive growth. Um, so again, we'll get back to that. But really, again, if you're taking notes, if you're in that ideation phase, uh, or if you're currently in that beta phase, or certainly if you're in that live set scale stage, you want to make sure if you don't currently know those things to, to make a note to start tomorrow. Uh, the second is a roadmap. Again, setting expectations to Debbie Smith under promise, over deliver. What is that under promise? Where is your program going? How are you developing it? Right? How are you communicating those short-term goals and those long-term goals and the impact that you're gonna have in the organization? It's key. The next is project management. It gets overlooked all the time, right? We have to focus on creating content. Forget about everything else. I think I, you see it all the time. Um, whether that's on, on LinkedIn or in conversations. Project management can make or break your team. Pick a methodology that works for you, that aligns with your business. Is it going to be agile? Is it going to be scrum? Is it going to be waterfall? There's no right answer here. But make sure you have program management in place, whether you're using a software to do that, Excel spreadsheets, again, specific to your team, your organization, and your skill sets to make sure you have your program management. And then the last is metrics. In the list of questions that we received for today, lots of questions around metrics, rightfully so. Right? How do we measure customer education? Is customer education even something that's measurable? How do we use metrics in the beginning when there isn't much data? Right? So a slide that I love to speak to is this idea of breaking down your metrics into three sections. You have your high-level business metrics, you have your department metrics or goals, and then you have your team goals. When we talk about how to get funding and how to grow your team, it all goes back to, again, what I mentioned around culture. How do teams, how do executive teams, 
How do those funding different programs like the customer education program think about developing programs? A lot of the words, use of the word program, but let me give you an example. If I'm a VP and I say, or an executive, somebody who's making a decision, I say, we need a customer education program. I saw a stat that it increases retention and increases product usage, increases NPS. I want a program, here's a million dollars, get it done, show me results in six months. We're not even gonna have our first cohort of customers go through that, let alone be able to show a retention metric of six to 12 months missed set expectations right from the beginning. The teams and companies that I see do it right, they start with the team goals, just like when you're developing a product, right? You don't say develop a product and show me X amount of revenue tomorrow. You say, okay, develop a product and show me somebody's gonna use it and get value from it. I saw somebody earlier mention, it's not about creating training, it's about creating a product. Your customer education program and the content within it is a product. So spot on. So let's develop a product. Let's see if we can even get people there. And if we get them there, are they engaging with the content? What are those completion rates? What is that NPS? That's stage one of proving the value of your customer education program. Those are the metrics that you can report on from day one, whether that's YouTube embedded on a website page or an LMS. Have your expectations set. If we hit that, we're going to need more investment because we're going to start focusing on our department goals. From there, we can then work up six months, a year, a year and a half later into those business metrics. It's going to take time for someone to come up to the one-year contract or their six-month contract and also engage in customer education. So we want to make sure, again, that the reporting we're doing at any given time is aligned with where the program is at a specific time. Integrations are going to be key for anything going from your learner data to your department and business goals. Uh, and that's something very important um, for, for us to keep in mind is it's going to take time to get the data to then be able to gather the insights and report on them. So again, when you're setting your expectations, make sure you're not setting expectations that you're going to be able to report, again, on those business impact or department goals right off the bat. All right, stakeholder management, probably my favorite, and I'd say the area that's most overlooked uh, in the blueprint that we're sharing today. Uh, and this is, again, this idea of a strategic customer education program and the fact that it just can't drive value or deliver value in a vacuum. So how do we solve for that? First, we take ownership. Very important. We're taking ownership of the fact that we have a program, right? Whether we're developing this program or it's currently in existence and we're saying to ourselves, okay, it exists. Doesn't guarantee the fact that it's going to exist six months from now or a year from now. And if you're the leader of that program or you're a VP who's supporting that leader, that has to be the mindset. For those of us who've been in SaaS, or who work in SaaS, we know how quickly initiatives can change, priorities can change, resources can change. Right? So as a customer education program, as the leader, and even for everybody who's a part of that program, we need to be asking ourselves, how are we aligning with marketing, with sales, with customer success, and with product? And then we have to say to ourselves, well, let's dissect product. How is customer education going to help the product managers? What are they gold on? Are they gold on product usage? Are they gold on something else? What's the support team gold on? How can we use customer education to help that? Right now, we're getting into asking ourselves: How do we align this program today? And then, as our stakeholders change over, as the business metrics, right, the key metrics, the key priorities that we talked about earlier, change. How do we make sure that we're constantly pivoting the way we can use this education to drive the most value for where the business is at any given time? Don't get caught in this false sense of security of our team exists today, so it's always going to exist. The businesses are changing, the business is evolving, the business is growing. You have to grow with it. And the only way you can do that effectively is if you are fully connected with 
your marketing, your sales, your customer success, and your product team. And there might be other things too. Of course, we could call probably out finance and we could get into some, some sub segments of these different teams. But as a starter, Google stakeholder analysis, build a stakeholder map, and then build a plan. We'll talk about this in the workshop as well, but super important as you go into building a program to be thinking about your stakeholder management. All right, content design and development. Chris, you're going on to section number four and we're just talking about content design? Yes. And the reason being, you can build the best content in the world, but if you aren't able to get people to that content and you're not able to build a great team, there's not much use of that content. So I broke down content design development into three sections, right? And we can unpack each one of these extensively. Right. Lindsay Peebo on our team focuses on this. This is her expertise. Um, but from a high level, what we're going to talk about today is really three sections. First is your content architecture. Asking yourself, how are we going to drive efficiency and effectiveness of our content through the architecture of how we're designing the content in and of itself? So the way I like to think about it, again, your company might use different terms here, but this idea of an asset a blog post, a video, um, it could be an ebook, um, could be an assessment, uh, could be something else, but an individual asset. And we're gonna have multiple assets, hundreds, thousands of assets in our library. We're going to then use those assets within lessons. Right? So a lesson is gonna be focused on teaching somebody a topic. And then within a course, right, we're gonna have multiple lessons. And then with multiple courses could potentially comprise a learning path. Okay. This idea of kind of thinking and breaking this up helps in so many ways. The first is when you think about localizing this content, okay. that's one way. Another is for repurposing content. If you architect all of your content like this and you get to that place where you say, man, this customer education is good. Why aren't we using this for our employees? 100% of the content for your customers are not going to need, but 80% they'll probably benefit from. So now we can asset by asset repurpose that content as it makes sense for employees or for partners or for prospects. If we're just creating courses and not thinking about how we can repurpose and reuse that content and update that content, it's going to create a lot of problems moving forward. Or I should say, it's going to make it more difficult to scale and get effective, uh, drive efficiency out of your work. The next is the content development process. So this should be something that's repeatable and flexible. And I always go back to the ADDIE model. Again, in the instructional design world, we can talk about so many different models, what makes the most sense for your business, how to create the best content. Um, but the ADDIE model is, really one to one to start with, I would recommend. And this is the idea of analyzing what you're going to create, then designing it, then developing it, then implementing that development, whether that's in a live training or potentially in an on-demand uh, course, and then evaluating that. Right? And again, similar to that, the innovation stage in the growth model, that evaluation should probably be happening in every stage. Um, and, and this is a really great place. To then we can get into the details of when we are designing or developing it. What is our style guide? What is the brand tone and voice? Uh, what is our percentage of video to um, something else? Um, so we can, we can really get into the nitty gritty here. But the call out here is to have a content development process. Again, it might sound like, well, of course, Chris, but you'd be surprised at how many businesses are just developing content. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's what they're doing. And it makes it really hard to scale your program. If you don't have that repeatable process, flexible enough to be engaging, to be personalized, certainly, but also rigorous enough to ensure that the content that is developed is scalable and you can have expectations around the time and costs to develop that content. The last is the content update process. This gets lost. And there's certainly been times in my career when a lot of the content I, my team is responsible for was out of date. And this can happen quickly product changes, something changes in the industry. And all of a sudden you say to yourself, 
all of that content that was so useful and helpful is now out of date. How do we make sure that this doesn't happen? Content database, right? make sure all of your content is stored somewhere where you can then also track and have an update priority model. Um, this is something that's really important, right? How are you making sure that when your product team, right, part of that alignment we talked about, when your product team has a new piece of product or a new tool or new feature in beta, how is your team being notified of that? Can you use project management software to automate that? There's lots of different ways I've seen companies do this, whether they're using Airtable or they're using Jira or they're using uh, Asana. Depending again on your business's current project management update processes, this is gonna change, but have this. For every piece of content, for every asset you create, you should be tagging what product does that touch, right? What pieces of the software is that are you educating on? What industry concepts are you touching on? What best practices are those going to change? All of this you want to be track, you want to be tracking and then have an update priority model to understand. Is this a critical update that we need to drop everything today? Or can we push that off because it's really just changing a blue button to a yellow button in the software? And that's not really going to change how somebody learns. Okay, so let's go back to this average good and great again. What does average content help with? Help somebody how to use software. What does good content or good customer education program content typically include? How to use the software and some best practices, right? To, to tactically apply what's being learned to a business. And then what does great customer education content look like? Well, it's helping somebody to use the software but also to think through the strategies that go along with what they're trying to do and ways in which they can apply those best practices, right? Lots of times that will include examples and use cases, um, possibly research studies. But again, getting out of this mindset of customer education is teaching somebody a product. Customer education is teaching somebody how to be successful in their role and how that success drives business value. All right, tech stack design. All right, so we're, we're going to break this down here into six different sections. I'm going to do my best not to read through all of this, but thinking about these sections again, if you're in that you're you're in it, you're ID eating right now, or you're in that beta space, these are the sections you're going to want to ask yourself and to make sure you have answers for. How are we going to deliver the educational content? could be something as simple as a PDF, or you might be using a full-fledged LMS. Content development tools. Are you developing in Microsoft Word, Google Sheets? Are you using authoring tools? Does your LMS, if you have an LMS, have authoring tools included? assessment tools, right? Are you using quiz software, test certification software? Does your LMS have what it needs? Reporting tools, qualitative and quantitative learning metrics. Does your LMS do that? Operations, similarly, that project management, what does your company currently use? Integrations, similarly, how do we get all of this learner data into our data pools at our business, right? Into uh, our CRM. We need to be able to look at all of those things. Um, so as we think about our tech stack, here's our starting point. Remember, every time you add another piece of software to your test tech stack, it's only going to make things more complicated for your processes, whether that's bringing a piece, piece of content live or that's developing a net new piece of content. So I always like to say, take the time to do an exercise every three to six months. List out everything you have. Of course, you probably want that with how much it's costing your team and ask, if I get rid of that piece of uh, that, that software, that tool, what is that going to do for my business, for my team? Is that gonna make it harder? Is that actually gonna make it easier? Or if I get rid of that, am I able to swap it out for a different piece of software that's gonna be more beneficial? Right? This should be something that is constantly going on with your team and never just set your stack and think we're good to go because there's going to be areas in which you end up hurting yourself in terms of your ability to scale. 
All right, second to last one, marketing or customer education. Uh, I see some questions here about um, more information on content databases. All right, definitely reach out to me. I can walk, I can walk people through some examples. Um, and certainly again, in the workshop, we'll focus on doing a lightweight um, Google Sheet development of uh, that type of uh, content database. Excuse me. All right, marketing your customer education. If you build it, they will come. I'd be curious to know if anybody else has experienced this in their career, for those of you uh, who, are, who have been in customer education. But I'll talk to teams and they'll create all this great content and no one's consuming it. And it's this idea that, well, if our team exists, there must be need for our, our, what we're doing. And then it never ends up actually getting consumed. So this goes back to stakeholder management again and your map and your plan. Who in the sales team do I need to talk to? Is it sales enablement? Is it a VP of sales? What do we do to make sure that sales can use this great content we're producing as part of their way of communicating to prospects that the business is invested, not just in selling them the software, but invest in the success of that implementation. Right? One of the scariest things in buying a big piece of software or buying any software is the change in management and whether or not that software is actually going to be adopted by the users. Give the sales team what they need to be able to communicate the value of your educational content. The marketing team, right? Making sure the resources are there and there's alignment for having the necessary website pages or integrations into your LMS to make sure that they can send emails to prospects, to your team, uh, to, to the learners, social. Are you gonna have your own social channels? Is marketing gonna own those channels? Are you gonna share channels, press releases? There's so much that goes into this. And again, when it comes to that stakeholder analysis and mapping, long before your content is live, if it isn't already live, you want to be building those relationships and getting those commitments uh, up and down the chain. Customer success, again, depending on where your team sits, this might be a, a layup or it might be difficult. So again, thinking about how do you integrate this educational content into onboarding, into the strategy sessions that account managers or CSMs might be having, uh, into the community if that's where the community sits within your org structure. Um, but again, thinking of, thinking to yourself, how can we strategically use this content based off of the business initiatives and key metrics at any given time within each department right? and then product? Is there a place for your customer education to live in the product? Short videos on specific page, uh, specific uh, parts of the, the software, maybe a link to your customer education um, website or LMS. Technical documentation, is there a place there to link or, or find a way to, to share content, customer education content within the technical documentation? Many different ways to think about this, right? But again, going back to your marketing starts, as soon as you have that stakeholder map and you've identified the folks and working with them to get the commitment and the time. Right? Marketing has their own goals. Marketing has their own initiatives. It's gonna take work and it's not guaranteed that marketing is going to be able to support you in the way you need. That's on you, whether you're the program manager or you maybe you're somebody within the team developing that content to work together to get all of these folks bought in to help and use your content uh, in a way that can truly drive that strategic business value that we've been talking about all day. And then last, I should have put this first. It always, get, it always gets pushed to the bottom and always gets forget, forgotten with customer education programs. But don't forget about that learner engagement and support. If we go all the way back to the, the beginning of today, and many folks shared who was that teacher or that professor that inspired them, right? that changed their life in some way, put them down a path to a, a hobby or maybe a career. It was a person. You engaged with them. They were real. They cared about what they were teaching. And that same thing uh, goes in line with this idea of engagement and support for your program. Average customer education programs, and again, these are generalizations. There's no customer education support specifically. Right? All questions uh, and issues go to general support, if that. 
right? And there's no opportunity for learners to engage with the team. There's instructor live training. Well, by default, there's some engagement, but in all of the formats that are async, hmm, the content's there, but the team is completely disassociated with it, right? And when you start saying to yourself, well, well what does good customer education programs look like when it comes to engagement and support? There's some type of limited customer education support, usually specific to technical issues, right? There's an email address, there's a chat. It's, hey, I'm having some problems here. My certification's not showing. Um, this page isn't loading. Maybe there's something wrong with the video. Hmm, okay. There's something there, right? There, there's some engagement. There's some effort shown on the behalf of the, the business and the customer education program that they're there to help folks who are learning. And then the limited opportunity for learners to engage with the team. If we get to this last piece, um, that's where we get into thinking about the, the great customer education programs, right? Full customer education support. That includes technical issues and content discussion. Right? I see someone said some LMS platforms have the discussion area, but it's of limited value, says Pam. I would say how you use that is dependent on the value that you get out of it. And, but opening up and saying, hey, we're here, right? We're here for business. We are a customer education team producing educational content to help you be better at your job, to help you drive business value for your business. What questions do you have? It doesn't have to be 24 seven. You can find different ways to do that. It can be async on um, an LMS platform in your community. But again, opening those lines of communication, saying we're real people here developing this for you. We care about your success and we're here to chat. And Pam said communities are helping a lot, love it. And then this multi-channel opportunity for learners to engage, right? Are they engaging on LinkedIn, on Twitter, through email, right? It doesn't have to be a personal email, it can be a general email box. Um, could it be through study groups? There's so many different ways, but again, finding opportunities for that, those inspiration, those inspirational moments, those moments to say, wow, there's somebody on the other side of that video. There's somebody on the other side of that workbook who actually cares. And the best part about that is when your team starts engaging with their learners, I promise you they will develop better and better content. At the end of the day, as we sum this all up, it's nearly impossible for somebody to create engaging, inspirational content that drives transformation with somebody's job or the business that they're working for if they're doing it in a silo. The multi-channel opportunity is that last piece of your, uh, of really your, your ability to continually improve and update your content, not based off of just what the data is saying, but also by really engaging with and having relations, business relationships uh, with your actual learners. Okay. That was a crash course through all seven, seven of these areas. So where do we go from here? As promised, it's been shared already in the chat pane. We are in a few weeks. Uh, we have to set the date, so we have a pre-registration, but, but um, we are partnering with Learn World uh, to, 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 to have like a true workshopping session. It's gonna be all day. We're gonna have three sessions, one around, around program leadership, one around program management, and one around this educational uh, content design and development. Um, I know that's only three of the seven. There's no way we could get through more. Um, then three in the day. Um, so probably or potentially we'll have a follow on to discuss these other parts of the blueprint. Um, but for starters, we're going to be going through these three sections. We'll have Lindsay on the educational content side. Uh, I'll be working uh, with Sarah um, on the program and program management side. If you're wondering who those two folks are, check out our website. Three of us together are SAS Academy Advisors. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Panos. I want to thank you all. I know it was a very much a one-way discussion. I'm really looking forward to reading through the chat pane. Um, and just a reminder, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, send me a message, go to our website. We can engage there as well. Um, it was a pleasure to share um, this from a high level of, of uh, my experience over the last few years, speaking to, to many different businesses who are in different stages of customer uh, education programs. Um, and again, thank you all for coming today. And I'm going to pass it back to Panos, who now is going to go into some examples. Thanks, Chris, for this uh, presentation. I, it's, uh, I really wish uh, we've, we'd known each other six years ago and or we had access to content like that when we were launching our own uh, Learn Worlds Academy. 
I have to say that as a small bootstrap startup back then, we didn't have the resources to devote to creating a, a full-blown uh, SaaS Academy, the LearnWorlds Academy, as we envisaged it. So we were always, you know, postponing it and we were trying to, to get the, the, the resources or create a small MVP just to, to measure whether it was worth it to, uh, to launch a, a project like that. Uh, we always like to to eat our own dog food here in LearnWorlds, but I, I admit that for our standards, we were late in launching our own academy. So we started very light. We we we, discuss, we made all the mistakes probably that you, you mentioned here in the in the um, uh, in your presentation. So we learned the, the the hard way. I can definitely confirm most of the things that you that you mentioned here from from our own experience. But no, nobody needs to reinvent all the wheels so it's great that you are offering all this uh, all this amazing content here and also i'm sure that the workshop is going to be tremendously helpful for everybody whatever their stage is in uh, in building their own uh, academy one thing that i i have to say that the point when we realized the value that an academy can offer to a business like ours is when we when we saw the numbers uh and we weren't very metrics focused, I guess, back then, again, as a, as a very small team. And we saw that people who were accessing, registering for the LearnWorlds Academy, even when they didn't actually consume the courses that we had there, like the onboarding courses and the, and, you know, and the product discovery courses, they were 50, they had 50% more chances of converting to customers. And we realized after talking to several customers that just the existence of the LearnWorlds Academy, just knowing that whenever they might need help to better use our product, they will not just have the option of uh, contacting customer support or customer success, but they will also have a, a great self-serve uh, option where they can go in, study, get a certification. So th that's the moment that where we realize that this can be an amazing asset, an amazing resource for uh, for our business and for every for any business at uh, at uh, I guess at our own uh, at the same uh, stage. So uh, the it was even for me today uh, and after launching I guess our own academy, uh, it was a, a great presentation from uh, from your end. And just to to clarify that whatever uh, Chris meant, presented today is absolutely platform agnostic and medium agnostic most of the things you can implement in in many different uh, in many different cases uh, but just to mention why we are partnering with Chris and why when sponsoring this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this content is that we we discovered that the way that our platform has been developed and uh, the 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 kind of features it packs and how it has been created in order to offer engaging interactive consumer grade experiences it really fits very, very well to the standards that a modern customer education academy should have uh, today. So even though you can implement everything that Chris mentioned in, um, uh, in, uh, in lots of different ways, I can definitely confirm from the experience of our own customers that we tick all the boxes and you can really, really save lots of your time and lots of the budget that we've seen, so how scarce it is, and uh, lots of the of the human resources by choosing a, the right tool that can be scalable from a customer education team of one. As I saw somebody uh, mentioning that in the in the chat, all the way to a full blown team with uh, with uh, all the different roles, the, the the videographers and the people shooting the videos, and the learning and development uh, designers and the instructional designers and all this stuff. Somebody, a, a tool that can grow with your business, that can take you from the first uh, stage of experimenting and beta testing and uh, and making sure that uh, such a a function uh, would be valuable to your business all the way to powering an academy with uh, dozens of thousands of, uh, of users. And I will, I will just mention some of the things, hope, hoping that uh, it will help you in your own choice. I will not mention the things that LearnWorlds does as a, as, a, uh, as a product. I will say, I will mention what our customers uh, were looking for when they were making their own uh, their own choices for a customer education tool. So this is very very important to 
uh, again, in a modern setting and trying to be resource efficient and mindful of the uh, of uh, and, and cost effective and mindful of the of the time and capacity of all the, of all the people in your team, you have to make sure that the tool that you choose offers the right ease of use. It has all the different user roles, the admins, the end users, uh, and it has all the the user friendliness that somebody would expect from a, from a software tool in this uh, day and age. And I have to say that traditional LMSs in most cases are very clunky and are, are very uh, are, are, are quite slow for what we're trying to do here. Most learning management systems, unfortunately, still are focused on the management of learning and not to, on the learning itself. While today's users, they want a really fast, user-friendly, engaging, interactive experience. And this is something that only a consumer-grade, designed-for-purpose tool can, uh, can offer to them. You have to make sure that the tool you choose is flexible and scalable as your team will grow and as your content will expand. And as you will try to take over more, more functions, you, you have to make sure that the, t- that the tool scales along with you. Mobile friendliness is very, very important. We, we see today more than 50% of the content consumption in, uh, across different learning world schools happens from mobile devices. So not only do you need to, be, uh, to, to have a platform that is mobile friendly and that anybody can use it anywhere, anytime, but also uh, offering a, a, a white label app for your, uh, for your academy can, can make a huge difference so that people don't access it through a web browser, but you can have a purpose-built uh, app that only uh, is one type tap away from, uh, from in the screen of your, of your mobile phone. The authoring capabilities are, are very important. People mentioned that in some cases, you start from a PDF. That, that, that this can be the only uh, asset that you may have. Yes, even such a thing should be uh, uh, supported by a tool that uh, that you would be using. But also, as you grow and as you're able to build in uh, more uh, custom content, you can have videos, you can have assessments, you can have uh, quizzes, you can have interactive videos. And that's something that we you can do in, uh, in LearnWorlds where you can just get a screen capture or a recording of somebody using your tool and you can go in and add labels and very in a very user-friendly way, add labels and repurpose a traditional linear video to an engaging interactive uh, experience. Even you can convert it into a video quiz. Reporting capabilities are tremendously important. Chris mentioned about how you need to convince people up and down the chain about the, the ROI of this of an investment of such uh, magnitude. So you have to make sure that you are able to see where your students are, what are they doing, uh, what kind of content they are consuming, and to be able to make correlations with other business metrics, whether it's the the marketing function, whether it's uh, retention, acquisition, uh, revenue, or or anything else. So you have to make sure that the tool can can support uh, this kind of, uh, of measurement. Brand, brand control is tremendously important for uh, for today's businesses. You cannot just get uh, a clunky platform and and try to uh, to make it match your existing branding. This is you, you have to control the brand. You have to 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 make sure that the platform feels a natural extension, a seamless extension of your existing website or of your existing application. So you should be able to make sure that the look and feel absolutely matches what you offer in other parts of your business. Data ownership, of course, is important, especially now when we're talking about GDPR and other data management policies out there. You have to make sure that uh, all these things add up together and, and that we are really compliant with all sorts of uh, laws and, uh, and regulations. Be able to integrate with the tech stack that uh, Chris mentioned, whether it's uh, whether it happens with uh, built-in integrations, for example, that tie in with your email marketing tool or with a powerful API where you can go in and customize the, 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 the login, let's say, of the users to the platform, the reporting or, or other uh, functions. So you need to, to be uh, able to make sure that uh, the, the platform is also customer-centric and really matches the experience that you, you need to offer. And I, I would just like to mention uh, one example of an of a, a lear- academy that is 100% built on LearnWorlds, uh, and this is Send in Blue. This is a digital marketing tool uh, that is coming out of, uh, of France. I think in 2021, they were uh, ranked in the top 100 software businesses. 
their academy right now, I think they send more than 100 uh, e- million emails uh, per day and they have about 300,000 users. Already in, in their academy, I think they have about uh, 10,000 users that are being trained about the software. And you can imagine their partners and power users and people who get certified in how to use the Send in Blue uh, digital marketing and, um, and email software. So this is an amazing case study. And I'm only referring to that because uh, a couple of months ago, we had a, another webinar with them about, uh, again, customer education and how they are using uh, a tool like LearnWorlds to build their uh, customer education academy and what kind of results they get out of that. So what you see here is the uh, Send in Blue Academy, uh, which is powered by LearnWolves. It's, uh, it, uh, it is hosted the, in, in four different languages. So uh, Send in Blue is an international tool, so they want to make to, to copy this experience and be able to offer it uh, in, uh, in all their different, uh, their different markets. And, and this is a tool that has a seamless integration with their existing website. So it's very easy to offer access to this community from multiple touch points within the, the experience of the software or to tie it into the, to the customer support, to the customer success uh, uh, function. So this is, this is just uh, one case. Obviously, as we mentioned, everything that Chris here uh, talked about today and uh, the things that will be touched upon on the, on the workshop can be uh, can be powered by many different uh, platforms, I guess, and also people can invest. And we have seen that happening: people investing dozens and hundreds of thousands of dollars for creating a, 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 some some kind of um, of custom um, uh, platform. But also, we are very aware, and this is something that our customers are saying to us: that you don't have to reinvent on the wheels. You can find a a great off-the-shelf software that offers these kinds of functionality and uh, allows you to build uh, uh, your own academy at a fraction of the cost and at a fraction of the the time uh, than if you were to do everything from uh, from scratch. So uh, I don't. I know that we are uh, we've uh, we've passed the the allotted time, but definitely we want to touch some of your uh, questions. So I'm stopping here the share and. um, and let's see if we can find the time to 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 answer uh, as many questions as uh, possible. So, uh, Chris. All right, I'm back. Uh, the first one we had from Katie in the chat pane recently was, uh, do most companies start small and then go advanced? And I think, Panos, you explained, you did that at Learn Worlds. And my answer would be yes, Katie. Um, start small, test some content, make sure the content resonates, Make sure you understand who you're actually trying to educate, how they like to learn. Um, but I would say definitely start small, uh, do some tests, learn. And then when you feel comfortable that you found a quote unquote product market fit, right, the education is working for its purpose to help um, your learners achieve their goals. Then it's time to say, okay, we're ready to sell this. We're ready to create more content like this. And typically that means we're ready for more investment. And this is, if I, if I may add, this is also what will... Uh make sure uh, what will help you with uh, getting the resources that you need. It's not easy in in most businesses, especially in the times we're in, you can not just go out and ask for a million dollars to build the the ideal uh, customer education uh, product. You have to go in, you have sometimes to to start small, measure, prove that you are bringing back value to the business and to the the customer and uh, to the customers, and then you can go on and ask for more and, uh, and keep improving. And a good follow-up to that is Noel uh, asked a question when uh, they were registering um, specifically around how do you get this done, create a customer education team, when also being responsible for training employees and partners, uh, which, is, which is a difficult question. Um, any thoughts on that, Panos, before I jump in? Uh, sorry, Chris, I was choosing another question. Not a problem. I will, I will, I will go first. Um, so again, the question was just, how, how does a person of one t- train uh, customers, employees, and partners? Um, and I would say you can't, you don't, um, not, not in a holistic way, not in a strategic way, um, but you can take the tact of maybe it's not you doing the educating, right? Are there ways to empower your employees to teach each other? Are there ways to empower uh, your partners to teach each other? 
right? Can that be courses in which they're subject matter experts? You're designing the curriculum, they're delivering it, right? There's many different ways, small groups, small webinars. Um, so to your question, uh, no, there's ways to do it, um, but it's gonna be definitely a, a little bit more on the leveraging other folks to do the educating versus having yourself create all that educational content and keep it up to date. And if I may, if I may add, yes, there's definitely never a silver bullet where you can create a program and just uh, solve all your programs. But uh, we've seen people being very close to a silver bullet by repurposing uh, to a great extent all the all their the, uh, the the content that they that they have by like getting uh, like really granular videos and then adding more content and obviously talking different ways to a customer than, and than to a, to a partner or than to to a, to a trainee and for us for from customers of of the learn worlds platform and sometimes we find ourselves in the uh, in the uh, you know in the awkward position people start you know sometimes with a internal training academy they want to educate their their employees then they see how easy it is to create content and they say okay but can we also have a free public course where we can start educating our customers about a certain part of the platform? And we say, yes, of course. I mean, I mean, in some cases, you can just start by cloning a course, repurposing the course and start offering it publicly. And then in some cases, they come back to us and say, okay, we had tremendous success with a free course about our product, but now we want to certify people. And we'd also like to have you know, a nominal price for the course. Can we also sell this course? And perhaps, who knows, at some point, this can be also a, a revenue generating uh, activity for the, for the business. Uh, I, I've heard about, for example, I had a discussion recently, companies like Splunk, where they, they have software for, for developers. If I'm not mistaken, 10% of their revenue comes from educating people about how to use their their product and certifying uh, and certifying uh, uh, users and developers and uh, and resellers. Not the, not day one. This is but this is something that uh, if you if you have a successful program at the, uh, after a certain level, you can also start thinking about how this ties up to other business functions within your organization. I see here a question about Patrick, which probably can uh, can uh, is uh, is relevant. We do actually have lots of customers who also offer certifications for their courses, both free and paid. So, doing like from a practical point of view, it's super easy in, to do it in a tool like LearnWorlds, where you just create your own um, template, let's say, of a certificate. You can tie it to the completion of a course or even to a full exam uh, about uh, about the, the course the, the content of the course and then you can have people who are certified in a, in a certain piece of, uh, of knowledge or to some skills they can get the certification they can even share this certification in their in their LinkedIn profile and this is how you can create power users for your uh, for your business or uh, certified agents resellers uh, partners channel partners whatever your business model uh, might, might be so the, this can can be a great uh, a great opportunity for your marketing and sales uh, uh, functions. Another question here from Peter about how to best uh, migrate my existing his existing paper based education offering to LearnWorlds. Well, I hope it's not just you know physical paper and you some somewhere have also the the, the original doc file. Uh, but we've also seen people doing that in LearnWorlds. You can just uh, we have a very powerful ebook functionality where you can just import a, a document and then enhance it and, uh, and uh, improve it with, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with images and screenshots and some videos. So you can have some great results even on a basic level by starting with uh, something like that. We have another question here. What is a realistic timeline to refresh and revamp old training and training materials? Uh, really good question. Uh, I would say it goes back to what that content is and why it needs to be refreshed, right? So it doesn't need to be refreshed because it doesn't align with your brand anymore. It doesn't need to be refreshed because it is out of date from a product perspective or it's out of date from an industry perspective. Um, so those are the three things that I usually ask myself before deciding if we're going to refresh it. Um, the, the fourth could be the way in which you 
um, tend to educate, uh, whether that's the format, right? Is it video first? Uh, is it text first? Is it multimedia first? Um, if the way in which you are educating folks um, has changed or evolved significantly, where the learning experience is no longer consistent from course to course, that would be a fourth, um, fourth reason when I'd say it might be time to update all the training and materials. Um, the fifth would be around if we're using ADDIE, that evaluation stage. If you're looking and you see that your learning objectives, those learning outcomes are no longer being met to a level um, that you've expected or never were. Right? You might create a course and you might realize that whole parts of that course need to be updated immediately based off of the knowledge checks, the tests, the workbooks, and other things that you're tracking that show that the education has area for improvement um, to allow that individual to get the most value out of the content. So those are five ways in which you could think through whether or not it's time to revamp. I'm sure there's certainly more, but that's what comes to, comes to mind for me um, right away. I think we can just tackle a couple more because I, uh, I'm afraid that uh, we, we will leave no space for, uh, for questions for the, for the workshop. And that's not something that we, that we want. And I'm also mindful of everybody's time and uh, how much uh, time people can devote to the, to the content here. Uh, some a question about key metrics uh, for uh, for customer success. Uh, let, let's say or customer education. Let's say uh, since we've uh, we've seen that about forty percent of people are in the in the first stage of uh, of thinking uh, about their customer education program. What would be let's say the very basic stuff to to start thinking about? Yeah. So for customer success metrics, uh, the, uh, the first place to start with, with is what is top of mind for your team today. Right? That could be something like, just going back through my experience, it could be something like getting users or getting customers to use X amount of apps on a monthly basis. It could be reducing the amount of customer success managers um, to customer load, right? So logos. So does each customer success manager have 50, 100, 300 accounts, right? In this day and age, there's a lot of things happening, some layoffs going on, <clears throat> the company might be looking to expand the book of business for CSMs. That could be a great area to start tracking of how can your educational content help there. Um, retention uh, is another one that's gonna come up. Um, so again, there, there's lots and on that slide I have even more listed, um, but I would say it goes back to where does your business need to see impact on the customer success metrics today? And then aligning the content behind those things that are most important to the business today. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I also see here a question from, uh, from Barbara about how to use existing knowledge articles for an education program. Uh, just offering some experience from, from our end, one of the things that we've seen uh, uh, really uh, lots of value from is the conversion of these knowledge articles to short uh, videos, like two, two or two and a half minute uh, videos. The, the videos can obviously enhance the articles themselves because you can just embed the, 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 video, the, the text. And it's people now, they like multimedia depending on uh, where you are and uh, whether you're on a mobile device or sitting on your sofa or whether commuting, you might not want to read the long form text. You might just want to, to spend a couple of minutes on the short videos. So with, uh, by, by creating some short videos for your, for your content articles, you can both enhance the articles and repurpose and use the videos uh, as part of a small uh, onboarding uh, online course. Or even you can just, in other cases, we've seen people embedding even the, these same videos within an onboarding wizard uh, as part of a, of a software. So uh, when the resources are not there, this is where we have to innovate and think a bit creatively about how with the with a with a small uh, with small with uh, with few resources, we can uh, we can get back eighty percent of the value, perhaps uh, by doing twenty percent of the work. Uh, so I think uh, Monica here that uh, really like the 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 webinar gives us a nice opportunity to say that uh, we are we have to conclude today's webinar. We 
really appreciate at least from my end all the questions and all this uh, all the feedback that we that we got this has been very energizing and we make sure to to go through all these questions and try to see how we can answer them or point you to the right uh, to the right resources and obviously this is something that we will definitely keep in mind both for the workshop but also for any other material that we will be creating along with chris and uh, uh, tapping into his uh, his uh, his expertise uh, content that we will be we should be creating in the next uh, few weeks and months about uh, customer education and helping you start uh, progress if you're already doing it or su succeed with your with your programs uh, from my end i have enjoyed this uh, i i really liked having chris with us but i definitely enjoyed it as a, a student myself uh, going through all this uh, presentation and i am really looking forward to, i'm really looking forward to the workshop itself Wonderful. Thanks again for having me. Thanks everybody for coming, staying. We still have a group, great group of people here. And again, remember myself, Sarah, Lindsay, and Learn Worlds, we're all open books here. We love to learn and share. Um, so feel free to, to reach out. And if you see an email from us, uh, it could certainly be us responding to one of your questions. So again, we'll try to answer them all. Um, as Pano said, feel free to reach out to us. We're, we're always here to help. Also, a huge thanks to Stella and Veronica, who worked very hard to, to build this, uh, to do this uh, uh, workshop and, uh, with this uh, webinar and the workshop along with uh, Chris's team. Thanks, everyone, for staying with us. Stay safe wherever we are and talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.